once around Pollux. Pollux is one of the two bright stars in the constellation of Gemini, the heavenly twins, Castor and Pollux. And Pollux gets the designation of being the beta star, beta Geminorium. With a magnitude of 1.14, it's actually brighter, though, than Alpha, Castor, by about half a magnitude. And you can see them in the diagram on the right-hand side at the heads of the two stick diagram men representing the twins. And there's something strange about that, that they're the wrong way around. It happens in other constellations, usually when one of the stars is much lower in the sky than the other, and the atmospheric extinction caused by the dirt and dust low down towards the horizon gets involved. But these two are quite high up, and they're also so close together that I don't really understand why they've got this one the wrong way around. Interesting. I wonder if there was a change in the brightness of the stars between uh, the measurements or something like that. We Hard to know. So Pollux itself, well, it's classed as a red giant. That really refers to the technical state of the inside of it, where it has exhausted its supply of hydrogen fuel in its core, and that's become a ball of inert helium, and hydrogen fusion is only going on further out now in an expanding shell around the dead nuclear core. And that outer expanding shell has a larger surface area, so the total amount of heat escaping from the shell is greater, and that drives the outer layer of the star to expand outwards. So we see it as orange. It's a K-type classification, K0, with a temperature of 4,666 Kelvin. And that's hotter than your typical red star, which would be 3,000 or so, but cooler than the sun, which is 5,800. But the mass of this object is 1.9 times that of the sun and the radius nine times. Now, they used to think the radius was even larger. They had it when it was first analyzed at 18 times the radius. But nine times means nine times in all three directions. So you have to cube nine, you get 729 times the volume. That's amazing given that you've only got twice the mass. So it's not very dense at all. And some people have described the outer layers of these stars as almost a hot vacuum. They're so thin. Of course, in the core, where all the nuclear fusion is going on and where that dense ball of helium is, right in the centre, it's a different story with all the overlying material. And you've got a lovely picture there of an artist's view of Pollux compared to the size of the sun at nine times the radius. But it's younger than the sun. It's only 1.2 time, uh, billion years old. That's uh, four times younger, a quarter of the sun's age, roughly. And that's an indication that being double the mass, it has raced through its available fuel. It might have double the mass and therefore have twice as much fuel, but it's burnt it about six times faster. And therefore it's turned into a giant after only a billion years or so and hasn't got long before it will exhaust its available fuel completely. But as a giant star, it's not particularly large. Here's a comparison of the Sun, Sirius, Pollux, and Arcturus, another orange giant. So there are much, much larger stars even than Arcturus out there. The, the red giants and the red supergiants are enormous by comparison. This makes Pollux really rather a tiny star, even though we're classifying it as a giant, and even though it is nine times the radius of the sun. It's also quite close to us, though. This is why we see it as so bright, just 34 light years away. And that makes it a record holder. It's the nearest giant star to the sun. Originally, it would have been an A-type star, a white star, and much hotter than the sun due to that larger mass. And, but then, of course, it burned through the fuel six times faster and ran out and swelled to be a giant star, cooling its outer layers and puffing them outwards in the process. It's got a companion. At least we think it has. It's given the designation Pollux B, but it's now been named Thestius, and Thestius is the patronym 
of Leda. Uh, Leda was the daughter of Thestius. And unfortunately, although that was suggested by a public um, vote for the name for this planet, it had already been used for an asteroid and indeed for one of Jupiter's moons. So it had been used twice already. They didn't want to use it a first, third time. So they came up with Thestius, the patronymic of Thestius. And uh, that seems fair to me. This was originally suspected back in 1993, but it took till 2006 using the full radial velocity method of looking for the wobble of the parent star caused by the gravity of this planet moving around it. And that's difficult because this is in a quite long orbit, 590 days, so over a year, getting on for two years to do a lap. But it is quite a large planet, 2.3 times the mass of Jupiter. <clears throat> so with an orbit 1.64 times as far from Pollux as we are from the Sun, 1.64 astronomical units, and the fact that the total power output from Pollux itself, the main star, is 32.7 times as much as we get from the Sun. So although it's cooler, it has that much larger surface area, in fact, 81 times the surface area, 4 pi r squared being the formula. So 9 squared, 81 times as uh, much area to emit light, but doing less of it per unit area because it's cooler, works out to 32.7 overall. That makes perfect sense. So if we work out how much heat that planet B is receiving compared to the Earth, we take 32.7 and divide by the square of the ratio of the distances, so 1.64 squared, and I've done that, and it works out at 12.2 times as much. So there's a lot more heat arriving. And from that, we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law. I like this. We take the power times, uh, well, set that to be equal to the fourth power of the temperature times a constant called Stefan Boltzmann constant, sigma there. So 12.2 times the power, we would get 12.2 to the power of a quarter as much temperature as the Earth. And 12.2 to the power of a quarter is just 1.87 by my calculations. So if we take the temperature of the Earth, which is minus 18 degrees C before any greenhouse effect, in fact, without any greenhouse effect, we'd all be freezing. It's bringing it up from minus 18 to about 20. So a 38 degree rise. And of course, what we're worried about is that that will become a 40 degree rise. But anyway, it's 255 degrees Kelvin. We have to use Kelvin in this calculation. And so if we take that, multiply by 1.87, we get 477 Kelvin, which is 204 degrees centigrade. So this would be uh, more than boiling. And uh, then you would have to add any greenhouse effect. And I would have thought that with uh, a large planet, 2.3 times the mass of Jupiter, you would have a significant amount of gases in the atmosphere to boost it. So I'm going to give this the designation pretty hot. But is it really there? Well, we're not absolutely sure. It's certainly been called into question because in studying the star Pollux, we discovered a 660 day rotation period for the star. And you might say, well, that's not 590, which is the supposed orbit of the star. But of course, one of the features of stars is that not all of the star rotates at the same rate. In fact, our sun, you typically find that the center of the sun, the equatorial regions are going around much faster than the polar regions carrying sunspots that are near the equator so that they overtake ones that are further towards the pole. And we think this is a common feature of all stars, all gas giant planets, just physics at work, really. And so it may well be that what we have been detecting with the 590 is in fact just related to the rotation of the star at all. So maybe Pollux B isn't there after all. And I await developments on this one 
I'm very interested to see if it comes out to be true or not. So thanks very much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed a little tiny tour once around Pollux.